beloved, that's all you need to move into this new year. You need a file of God's miracles. Be kind and encourage a neighbor and, and ask him this question, do you trust God? If your answer is yes, you really don't have much to worry about. If your answer is yes, you can go and get some sleep tonight. Because if you trust him, he'll fight you every battle. I, I, I want to move quickly tonight that we might honor our time. We've heard so many sermons and testimony. Allow me just to give a brief one from the Word of God as I invite you to share with me a reading from the book of Judges. In the Old Testament, the seventh book of the Bible is the book of Judges. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, then Judges. And if you would move quickly to the eighth chapter of the book of Judges, there is a word from the Lord that I want to lift up in your hearing, beginning in the fourth verse. And we ask those who are physically able to stand with us as we hear the word of God from Judges chapter 8, beginning in verse number 4. Welcome home, Mary. Welcome home. In the 8th chapter of the book of Judges, verse 4 begins, When Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 300 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted but still in pursuit. He said to the men of Sokoth, please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted. And I am pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. And the leaders of Sokoth said, are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand that we should give bread to your army? So Gideon said, for this cause, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. Then he went up from there to Peniel and spoke to them in the same way, and the men of Peniel answered him as the men of Sokoth had answered him. So he also spoke to the men of Peniel, saying, When I come back in peace, I will tear down this tower. Now Zeb and Zalmunna were at Karkor, and their armies with them, about 15,000, all who were left of all the army of the people of the east, for 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen. Gideon went up by the road of those who dwell in the tents on the east of Neboa and Jogbeah, and he attacked the army while the camp felt secure. When Zeba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued them, and he took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, and rooted the whole army. And Gideon, then Gideon the son of Joash, returned from battle from the ascent of Haris. And verse 28 says, Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted their heads no more. And the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. I want to hang out tonight very quickly in that fourth verse. It simply says, when Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 300 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted, but still in pursuit. Do me a favor, look at your neighbor and play preacher. Give him the sermon title. Tell him, neighbor, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. oh neighbor, I'm exhausted. But I, but I ain't done yet. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Many of us can look back on our collegiate experience and those years we spent on college campus. And you probably still to this day remember that one difficult course that you had to endure. That in order to get that degree, in order to clear that major, there's always that one class folk tell you, don't wait to take it in your senior year. Because if by chance you don't pass, you won't graduate. For me at Duke University, as a biomedical and electrical engineering major, that class was EE 170. Electrical engineering 170 pop, it was electromagnetic field theory. And the class was as difficult as the name sounds. The teacher was a brother by the name of Professor Tran. He may have been a genius in his field, but he was far from a good teacher. He had a very strong Asian accent that made him hard to understand. 
And Kevin, when he walked in the class, he would simply pick up a piece of chalk, face the chalkboard, and talk to the chalkboard while he wrote for 45 minutes every class. He never paused to take questions. He never had office hours. Johnny, when we got together for study groups, the study group was useless because nobody had notes because nobody understood what the <laughs> what he was teaching and what he was saying. But y'all, the, the class was so hard when we got to the final exam, we handed out the final and there were only five questions on the exam. Let me tell you how you know you're in trouble. When you read through all five questions and you don't know where to start on any of them, you know it's going to be a bad day. Matter of fact, the test was so hard that we, we couldn't even cheat. Because after about 10 minutes, everybody looked up at everybody else like. And so I did the only thing I knew to do. I start writing down every random formula I could remember. I wrote down stuff that didn't have nothing to do with the clear. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. I'm just writing down whatever I can, prayerful that extra credit will kick in somewhere. That was the last exam I had that semester. I went home. My grades were mailed to the house. I was back in the day when they still mailed your grades. The funny thing was the grades were addressed to me, but my dad opened them because he said he was paying for them. And he called me down and he asked me about the low grade that I had in EE 170. I'd gotten a C minus. And I was thankful to God because I thought I had failed. <laughs> but I survived that class by a great gift of God's grace called a curve. <laughs> now, now, if you don't know what a curve is, just let me tell you, it's God at work. Dad said, well, you must be happy that you've passed EE 170. And I said, not really. He said, why? I said, because when I go back in the spring, I got to take EE 170, one, advanced electromagnetic field theory. And my dad began to understood what I experienced then, that, that it kills your joy when you come to the end of something and it's taking everything you got to get there. Only for you to look up and recognize there's still more you got to do. It's a sad thing to be exhausted at the end and know that it's about to start all over again. But, but beloved, that, that, that's where Gideon shows up right here in this eighth chapter. You remember Gideon. We read about him in the book of Judges when the Midianites have taken over Israel. And in order to deliver Israel from the hand of the enemy, God decides to raise up a brother by the name of Gideon. Now you need to know God doesn't find Gideon in the sanctuary. Gideon's not in the temple. Gideon's not at prayer meeting. Gideon is not at New Year's Eve service. No, Gideon is thrashing wheat in the wine press. Now you're holy and sanctified, so you didn't catch it, so let me give it to you in 2015 language. Gideon is at the liquor store. And the Lord shows up outside of ABC. <laughs> How you know what that is? <laughs> Lord shows up at the liquor store and calls a brother and says, you're going to deliver my people from the hand of the Midianites. Beloved, let me just tell you real quick, you ought not ever judge someone's possibility by their current position. Because God has a way of moving people from some destitute and dirty places to being great in his kingdom to do things you never thought anybody like that could do. If you've been to Sunday school, you know how the story goes. Gideon decides to accept God's calling. And he gathers together 32,000 men to go to battle. God shows up in chapter 7 and says, no, that's too many. You can't win with that many folk. The Lord begins to edit associations and leaves Gideon with 300 men to go to battle. And the Bible says that with 300 men by his side, Gideon defeats the Midianites and the Amalekites, whose numbers were in the thousands. In chapter 7, they defeat the Midianites. 
Only for us to find out in chapter 8, the battle ain't over. In chapter 8, Gideon and these same 300 men are now at the border of Israel at the Jordan River. The Jordan River symbolizes the boundary of Israel, symbolizes the end of the promised land. And the word of the Lord is that Gideon and the 300 men are about to cross over the Jordan. They're about to cross over into a new land. They're about to make their transition into a new season. That they've come to the end of one year and are getting ready to cross over into a new year. And the testimony of the word of God is that this mighty man of valor with these 300 soldiers who've defeated thousands of Midianites, when he gets to the border and he's ready to cross over, the Bible says he's exhausted. That word exhausted used in scripture is this word ayefe. It, it means to be fatigued. It means to be worn out. It means to be running on empty. As a matter of fact, it, it, it means to be so tired that when you try to tell people you're tired, you leave the R out. And you don't say, I'm tired. You say, I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> they come to the place of crossing over, only to lift up their hands and say, I'm tired. That this battle, this journey, the struggles I've been through have worn me out. Yeah. Beloved, I come here to tell you that you can reach the place of crossing over into a new season, a new year, a new strategy of life, only to come to that place, and if you be honest with yourself and with God, you can declare on December 31st, with only 12 minutes left to the new year, I'm tired. Y'all, this has been an exhausting year. Nigerian girls kidnapped, Terrorist attacks on every corner of the globe. 298 mass shootings in America where more than four people were gunned down at one time. Oregon, San Bernardino, right here in Virginia, Charleston, South Carolina. This has been the year of Sandra Bland and Freddie Gray. This has been the year where we continue to have a justice system that fails to indict those who've taken the lives of young black unarmed individuals and nobody is held responsible. And I know you're holier than I am and you want me to be holy and you want me to be sanctified and you want me to be above all that, but I come here tonight to tell you I'm tired. I'm tired of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. I'm tired of having to continue to put on a shirt to remind folk that black lives matter. I am tired of all the nonsense going on in my home city of Chicago that's now called Chirac as black lives kill other black lives. I am tired of police officers not being indicted when they've taken black lives that were unarmed I am tired. I'm tired of all this political nonsense and tomfoolery and ignorance that is prevalent in the presidential elections. I am tired of Caitlyn Jenner and anything that has to do with Kardashian. I am tired. And, and, and you don't have to agree with my politics, but somebody, you come to church tonight and you're personally tired. I'm tired going back and forth to the doctor. I'm tired running back and forth to court with my child. I'm tired having to go down to school and get these teachers right. I'm tired of crazy coworkers. 
I'm tired of satanic supervisors who are incompetent and have the audacity to evaluate me. I am tired of struggling to make ends meet. Matter of fact, I'm tired of church because church folk didn't got on my last good nerve too. Matter of fact, I'm so tired, I'm tired of myself. I'm just sick and tired because it's been that kind of year. Is there anybody here that can just admit on the last night of this year that I am tired? Do me a favor, nudge your neighbor, tell them, I'm tired of you, I'm tired of you, I'm tired of you. <laughs> I'm exhausted. The Bible says that Gideon is exhausted. He's tired, but he's still in pursuit. That I'm exhausted, but, but I'm not finished yet. That there's still some things God wants from me as I cross over into this new season. And as you get ready to shout your way into 2016, let me press upon you some things that God says to people who are tired at the end of a journey, but they ain't done yet. He says, number one, I need you to know that, that I need you to complete your past projects. Well, would, you, would you be a preacher for a minute and just tell your neighbor, finish what you started? You need to understand why Gideon is crossing over. He's crossing over because he's chasing two Midianite kings named Zeba and Zaluma. Zeba and Zaluma were on the battlefield, but now they've escaped and they've gone to a place called Karkor. And Gideon gets a word from the Lord that lets him know, although the battle on the battlefield is over, your assignment is not done until you handle in chapter 8 what escaped you in chapter 7. That there's some stuff you thought you handled, but it has not been dealt with yet, and you cannot move forward until you go backwards and finish what you began way back then. I came by to preach to someone tonight that you've got some Zeba and some Zaluma on your agenda. There's some stuff you started last year, but God declares your new year will not begin until you cross that T, dot that I, handle that business, tie up those loose ends, and deal with some stuff that you thought was in your past. But beloved, I, I want you to understand that there's some things God said you just got to deal with in order to move forward. Now, the reason that's a real word is because many of us come in tonight and we've been deceived by the devil. Because the devil has led you to believe that on tomorrow morning when you wake up, your life is going to be different. <laughs> because it's a new year, it's going to be a new you. You're you going to lose weight. You're going to get back in the gym. You're going to bring your best self out. And the Lord says, listen, tomorrow will just be another day until you learn to deal with some stuff that's been lingering in your past that is affecting the possibility of peace in your future. God declares that there's some things you got to handle. So somebody, when you leave church, you got some business to handle. You got some conversations you need to have. You got some letters you need to write. You got some paperwork you need to file. You got some relationships you got to end. You got some loose ends to clean up. You got some apologies to offer. You, you got some work to do because there are things that were left over from last year that have to be dealt with before you deal with the new year. So the Lord said, listen, you got to deal with some of your past stuff. Then the second thing the Lord says, not only do I want you to complete past projects, I want you to separate from problematic people. Oh, that's some good gospel right there. Because somebody, you came to church tonight for God to tell you, just let them go. C can I preach this thing? The Bible says that Gideon, while he's chasing Zeba and Zaluma, he goes to the town of Sokoth and Peniel, and asks both of them for some bread. Can you help me out? 
And the Bible says that both of them refuse and reject him. Now, now the deep part about this is that Sokoth is the land that is owned by the tribe of Gad. And Peniel is the place where Jacob wrestled with an angel. Which is to suggest that everybody in Sukkoth and everybody in Peniel are Israelites. Gideon's own people. Folk that look like him. Folk that worship with him. Folk that serve the same God. And he recognizes that the people I thought would help me are the ones who rejected me when I need them most. Now, 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 now let me tell you why half the church is quiet. Because most people are paralyzed when they've been rejected. Somebody on your pew is dysfunctional if they're disliked. Someone you live with can't handle being turned down. And the minute folk reject and refuse, you can't operate. But what I like about Gideon is that when his own people turn him down, it doesn't stop him from doing what God called him to do. Give me, give me, give me. You want to know why Gideon can function even when he's been rejected? Because in chapter 7, when he showed up with 32,000 people, God taught him a valuable lesson. That you don't need all of them to get this here thing done. You don't need Lottie Dottie and everybody standing by your side. All you need is the assurance that God is with you and you don't need anybody else. What, what, what? Some, 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 I want you to understand that the biggest lesson God has been trying to teach you in 2015 is that everybody you want, you don't need. That's some good gospel right there. That everybody you love is not ordained to be in your life. And some people are poisonous to your destiny. Do me a favor. Would you know somebody ask them, have you learned your lesson? Can I tell you what I like about Gideon? When his own people turn him down. He doesn't beg them to change their mind. Because you got to reach a place in your walk with the Lord where you realize you ain't got to beg nobody to help you do nothing. If you don't want to help me, if you don't want to stand with me, if you don't want to support me, then baby, let them go. Can, can, can I teach Bible real quick? Let me tell you what Gideon does. When he recognizes that they won't help him, not only does he not beg him, watch what he does, he threatens them. That's cool. Y'all ain't got to help me. But when I come back by here and the Lord has brought victory, you will recognize that I didn't need your bread I didn't need your support. I didn't need your money. I didn't need your companionship because I've got a God who is able to make a way out of no way. I wish I had some independent sisters and brothers in this house who've learned the hard way that I don't need what you got because God is able to make a way life. Would you tell somebody, tell them the Lord to take care of me. Listen, listen, we, we, we got to get out of here. Listen, it says, it, says, it says, handle your past projects. Get away from problematic people. Then he says, and along your new journey, I want you to always reflect on my previous provisions. Because one thing you should never forget are the ways the Lord has made. One thing you should never forget are the doors God has opened. 
The prayers God has answered. The mountains God has moved. The healing God has brought. The provisions God has sent. The days God held you in the midnight hour. You should never forget how good God has been. Well, boy, I, I, I'm done. Listen, listen. Here it is. Watch how they move. They go across the Jordan into Sokoth and hang out at Peniel. They go across the Jordan into Sokoth and hang out in Peniel. Jordan, that's the river that God opens with his miraculous hand. Sokoth is the land God gave to Gad when Gad didn't even fight for it. God just gave it to him. Peniel is where Jacob wrestled with God, and he should have died, but the mercy of God held him. So when they cross the Jordan, they're crossing over the place of miracles. When they get in Sokoth, they're in the place of God's grace that gives you what you don't deserve. And when they get to Peniel, they remember that he is a merciful God who does not kill us when we deserve to die. And beloved, that's all you need to move into this new year. You need a file of God's miracles. Is there anybody here that knows he's worked some miracles in your life? If you don't have a miracle file, you ought to have a grace file of some things God blessed you with that you know you don't deserve. And if you don't have a grace file, you sure enough got a mercy file of how the Lord forgave you and protected you and shielded you. Is there anybody here that's got a miracle file, a grace file, a mercy file? And when I think of the miracles he's made, and when I think of the grace he's given, and when I think of the mercy of God, I will bless the Lord right here. Is there anybody here that can bless him right now in the new year? At the beginning, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. He's been good. He's been good. He's brought me through another year. He's kept me in spite of me. He's given me what I could not earn. So I say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. 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 Cross over into your new year with praise on your lips. Cross over into your new year with thanksgiving on your mind. Cross over. Hey, happy new year. Happy new year. Happy new year.